الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد All praise due to Allah. We praise Him the way He deserves to be praised. We ask Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace and send the salutations and blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Tonight's session is rather an interesting one for so many reasons. One of which is that it is hardly ever addressed or discussed. It is a, a, a topic that is hardly ever addressed or discussed. And from my experience, uh, Muslims have a lot of misconceptions, misunderstandings. I don't want to use the word ignorance, but nah, ignorance. Let me just say the word ignorance. They are very ignorant about some of these etiquettes that are related to the matters of um, istidhan, seeking permission, when you're visiting someone's home, or when you're entering someone's home, or when you're entering a room. And then also the etiquettes of majalis and gatherings, when you're gathered with people, when you're sitting with people, how are you supposed to conduct yourself? How are you supposed to behave? Uh, how are you supposed to be? In other words, this is the uh, topic that I would like to discuss. And uh, I want your full attention, inshallah ta'ala, because it's a little intricate. And you, you, the narrations are very straightforward. And I don't want you to lose track of the sequence. All right. So before I start discussing them, I would like to reiterate the beauty of Islam. As you know, I'm uh, crazy in so many ways. And I, I'm not saying crazy in a negative sense. I'm, I'm crazy in a good way, I believe. And one of my, uh, one of my uh, materializations of my craziness is I usually start like liking some something and then I become somewhat obsessed with it and then I spend a lot of time uh, looking into it, researching it, studying it, listening to it. So in recent times I've been uh, watching a lot of uh, debates between uh, Muslims and atheists. Uh, there came a time when I was listening to debates between Muslims and Christians and then Christians and atheists which I found to be very interesting because they're two falsehoods trying to uh, debate with one another, uh, you know, and, and Christian being uh, less of a falsehood than atheism, but it's still not substantial enough to have a, an atheist leave atheism and move to Christianity because you're just moving from one dogma to uh, another dogma. Uh, but recently I've been listening to uh, Muslims, and there aren't that many that are qualified, and I don't want to mention names, but I've been listening to Muslim debating with atheists, and it, it just gives me that, re and uh, you have to be very careful. The first uh, disqual uh, disclaimer I would like to give is that if this is not your field, if you're not involved in da'wah, do not listen to these debates. Because unfortunately, uh, people, Muslims, that debate on these matters have no choice but to involve themselves in, in ilmul kalam, which is the, the knowledge or science of philosophy and, and uh, the science of talking. And, and, and accepting certain uh, principles, uh, uh, fallacies, uh, logic, accepting Judeo-Christian, uh, Judeo Judeo-Christian, uh, uh, different Greek philosophies. A lot of things have to be, in order to debate, you have to kind of agree with them on them. So you may de debate at their level. But in the process, you wind, up null you wind up going against so many Islamic teachings, so many fundamental teachings in Islam. So please be careful. I'm saying this just so I can bring to your attention the point and the fact that Islam remains to be the only solution to all of the problems of mankind. And with all the research I've done in my humble, humble uh, short life and my humble research, I haven't come across any ideology or religion or philosophy that is so comprehensive and so particular and so detailed as to tell you how to conduct yourself in every situation like Islam. And by Allah's grace and mercy, everything makes sense. And the only people that, that have a problem with uh, Islam making sense are people that are senseless. Are people that themselves lack common sense. And that's why they have a, a, a problem with certain teachings of Islam. If you don't have this problem, then in your fitrah is sound, then everything is beautiful. And so this is a reality. When we discuss, 
watch it right now. When we when we discuss the issue of how you're supposed to conduct yourself when you visit people and so on and so forth, when you sit with people, you will be baffled by the amount of instructions and guidance we receive from our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who was the best example for anybody who wanted to worship Allah the way Allah should be worshipped. The Prophet ﷺ was our example of how Allah should be worshipped. That is his role that he was sent with. If you want to worship Allah, you don't innovate and you don't use the Prophet as an intermediary. Rather, you worship Allah according to the way of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. The first thing we discuss about the etiquette, which is an abandoned sunnah, I think many Muslims are not even aware of it, and that is the taqdeem salam qabla al istidhan that you should first uh, begin with giving salam, salutations, before you actually seek permission. حدثنا رجل من بني عامر أنه استأذن على النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وهو في بيت قال أألج قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لخادمه أخرج إلى هذا فعلمه الاستئذان فقل له قل السلام عليكم أأدخل فسمع الرجل فقال السلام عليكم أأدخل فأذن له النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فدخل أخرجه أبو داود وأحمد وهو حديث صحيح صححه الألباني رحمه الله This man uh, narrated to us الربعي uh, that a man from Bani Amir came to enter upon the Prophet ﷺ while he was in a house. So the man said, should I enter? The Prophet ﷺ told his servant, go out and teach him how to seek permission. And say to him, say, Assalamu alaikum, should I come in? The man before the servant even told him, heard already. He heard the Prophet ﷺ, so he said, Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. Aadkhul? Should I enter? So the Prophet ﷺ permitted him to enter. Now, in today's context, if you are able to uh, communicate with the person upon whom you are going to enter, then you should actually begin with the salam before you ask whether you can come in or not. And I believe, wallahu alam, in my humble opinion, I haven't come across that many people that uh, practice this uh, abandoned sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So let us inshallah be among the pioneers in reviving a sunnah that has been left and abandoned by the Muslims. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us among the carriers of the barrier of the sunnah. Alhamdulillah. Secondly, that you should seek permission three times, otherwise you should return. In a hadith in Bukhari, a Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ قال, إذا إذا استأذن أحدكم ثلاثا فلم يؤذن له فليرجع. If one of you seeks permission three times and he's not granted permission, then let him return. Now Malik رحمه الله says in commenting, he said uh, seeking permission three times is the best, and I prefer that no one adds to that unless you believe that you were not heard. In which case, if there's no harm, if you actually do it more than three times. So if you believe that the people upon whom you're seeking, uh, the people you, whom you're seeking permission from to enter did not hear you, especially in modern day, when you have, you know, doors and you knock on the door, you ring on the bell and the people are inside, maybe they're inside the room, they can't hear you. If you believe they haven't heard you, of course, to understand this, meaning you ring on the bell or you knock three times. So in the context of modern day housing, you knock either three times and you, you make, you give, uh, the, the etiquette is that you have uh, space between them as to not to uh, make the people panic or scare the people in the house. So you give a, an interval, a time between each ring of the bell or each knock on the door. If you believe that the people heard you and you've asked for three times and no one replied, then you should leave. Thirdly, Ta'rif al mustadin nafsah. And this is so, so common. This is so, so common. Bismillah. An Jabirin radiyallahu anhu qal Ataytu al-Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi daynin kana ala abi fadaqaqtu al-bab faqala man dha faqultu ana 
فقال أنا أنا كأنه كرهها متفق عليه حديث بخاري المسلم from جابر he said I came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم due to a, a money that my dad owed him perhaps he came to pay him back so I knocked the door the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said who is it he said I said me and Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم kept repeating me me as if he hated that and to be frank with you this is one of the funniest things in the world because the person on the other side of the door is assuming that either his voice is so unique that the people know who it is uh, or that the people are able to see him or that he is so special and famous that when he says me then the people are going to be like oh you ma ya sheikh yani yani logic entails that you mention your name and this reminds me of a lot of people that communicate with me on on social platform i think uh, uh, the other day we had an online session and someone's account was called open open and then he writes he says brother do you remember meeting me in dubai yani i don't remember ever meeting someone's name was open open and if you just wrote open open and you ask me this question yani do you think i'm going to or i've had brothers with an with a random number yani anonymous number that I, they know i haven't saved they they got my number from someone then the first message they said brother do you remember me i said okay how am i going to remember you by the special font that you type with your sheikh the man the number is anonymous and you haven't even said who you are how in the world am i going to remember you so i don't know what's going on if the perception that the people have that they're popular or well known or just utter confusion regardless it's not okay for you to knock on the door and say me If your name is Ahmed, you say Ahmed, Abu Ahmed, Abdullah, Rabi'ah, George. If your name is George, I hope your name is not George. You gotta say your name. So from the etiquette of seeking permission is that you mention your name. And don't think you're so special by just merely saying me. Because everybody is me when they are knocking on the door. Everybody could be a me and it doesn't really give you a lot of information. It's like someone asks you, who are you? You say me. I am me. MashaAllah. How does that help me in, in enrolling you in this college? Well, I don't know. You got to figure it out. But I'm telling you, that's me. Fourthly, uh, fifthly, تَحْرِيمُ النَّظَرْ فِي بَيْتِ غَيْرِهِ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ Very important. عَنْ أَبِي هُرَيْرَةَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ عَنِ النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمْ قَالْ مَنِ اطَّلَعَ فِي بَيْتِ قَوْمٍ بِغَيْرِ إِذْنِهِمْ فَفْقُوا عَيْنَهُ فَف And this was narrated by Al-Nasai. And Al-Albani said it is Sahih according to the condition of Imam Muslim in the Sahih Al-Jamia. Hadith number 6046. And the reason why I'm giving you the reference because some of you might be... Uh, uh, some of you, it's okay. Some of you might be confused or shocked at the Hadith. The Hadith says whoever looks into someone's home without their permission, then poke his eye out. And there will be no dia, there will be no blood money, no payment, no retribution, and no wala qisas and no retribution. Yani, you know how we have, if you harm someone, then he can harm you back. Or that you have to pay them some, some equivalent money, equivalent for the harm. In the case of someone who looks, looks into the homes or the private uh, properties and the private homes or the private anything of people, you have the permission in Islam to poke his eye out. And you have nothing to pay back. You have no guilt against you whatsoever. Not in the dunya, nor in the akhirah. And the scholars say this applies to anything. So if somebody's trying to use the peephole to, to you know, uh, uh, sneak on you or to check you out or to watch you, go ahead and take his eye out. Uh, if someone's trying to, you know, look into any pr personal private matter of yours, so it's a very serious issue, brothers and sisters. It's a very serious issue and a lot of us are very nosy. Nosy and negligent. So when they walk around, they go to someone's home and, and, and it's, it's very challenging. I, I know, for example, where I used to live, whenever we go down you know, to the masjid, we're going from the third floor or second floor or whatever that was. And on the way down, subhanAllah, the neighbors happen to be opening you know, their doors open. He's also going to the masjid or whatever the case may be. Ya akhi, you have to lower your gaze. And I used to, alhamdulillah, by Allah's grace, make an effort and teach my children, don't look. Children are curious, but you could, his wife could be in there, uh, you know, not wearing her hijab, obviously in her own house. 
you could see something that is not rightfully yours. And so it's, it's from the etiquettes of looking that you don't look in this regard. Otherwise, you're taking a chance of your eye going bye-bye and you can't get it back. Uh, next is that if you, like we said, as Allah says in the Quran, وَإِنْ لَكُمْ ارْجِعُوا فَارْجِعُوا هُوَ أَزْكَى لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ عَلِيمٌ If it is said to you, go back, go back, it is purer for you. And Allah really knows what you're doing. The, the important thing is that if you go to someone's home, the point that we want to highlight, and they don't allow you in, don't have a grudge in your heart against them. Do not have a grudge in your heart against them. Understand that as Allah said, ذَلِكَ أَسْكَى لَكُمْ هُوَ أَسْكَى لَكُمْ It is purer for you. It is better for you that you do not uh, uh, enter. Allahu a'lam what the wisdom is that you were not allowed. But don't have any uh, hardship or any e unease, any unease in your heart regarding that rejection. Another interesting uh, etiquette regarding uh, visiting someone is on your way out if you want to leave. عن ابن عمر رضي الله عنهما قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا زار أحدكم أخاه فجلس عنده فلا يقومن حتى يستأذنه and the hadith was also authenticated by Sheikh Al-Albani رحمه الله in the silsila الصحيحة if one of you visits his brother and he is sitting there he should not leave and he doesn't get up until he seeks his permission and that is because if you suddenly decide to leave and you you know help yourself to the door and on the way to the door, you might enter upon his family or his wife or his daughters or whatever the case may be and see things that you're not allowed to see. So logically, if you visit someone, you do not just, you know, help yourself and leave. You have to seek permission from the person that you want to leave so that he can clear the way for you. Make sure that everybody's, you know, uh, uh, hiding or covered up and whatever the case may be. And then, you know, Bismillah, you grab yourself and leave. And so these are important. Again, uh, today... Uh, well, today, where are the visitations? Huh? With the coronavirus, I think the last time you visited uh, someone was yourself. Uh, when you went from one room to another room. And that's as good as it's getting for most of us right now. But back then, and inshallah in the future, if we ever go back to normal life, uh, when it comes to visitation, a lot of people don't observe these etiquettes. And you see people are negligent about them. And this, these are for the people that, that actually care. Now, don't ask about what I've discussed in the past when it comes to family members. Where everything goes. The brother-in-law, mashallah, goes into the kitchen while, the, while his brother's wife is cooking. And he wants to try uh, or check on the condition of the cooking for the iftar in Ramadan. And she's wearing her house clothes. Huh? And because, ya akhi, every time we discuss this, ya brother, it's the brother-in-law, but it's the brother-in-law, it's my brother, how can he, how would he ever look at my wife? Ya Sheikh, he would look at your wife and her mother also. And her daughter. It's a human tendency and the shaitan is ever whispering to people. This is something that you have to manage and control. Do you know the, the statistics? Statistically, I don't want to give you scary numbers. But in terms of numbers, everything goes in this world. Everything that you think is unimaginable and won't happen, happens. Happened, happens and will continue to happen. As long as people don't observe the deed of Allah. As long as we sideline the Quran and the Sunnah and we let our cultures govern, decide what we do, we will forever be in trouble. You will not have peace and you'll be surprised 10, 15 years later to find out that your own daughter had been exposed to things that you never imagined. And everybody was shh, shh, shh about it because they don't want to expose and they don't want to ruin the reputation of fulan and allan and, and so on and so forth they are masaib there are calamities happening behind closed doors because of this negligence oh she's my cousin oh she's my cousin oh she's spare us ya maulana sheikh spare us irham abuk khalas yani what is halal is halal what is haram is haram what is right is right what is wrong is wrong leave it at that do not transgress and violate those rules and regulations lest it backfires and explodes in our face. And this is what the Ummah lacks. The Ummah lacks adherence to the Sunnah. The Sahaba, ya Jamaat al Khair, the Sahaba were the exact opposite of what we are today. They were keen on everything that the Prophet ﷺ did, and we are keen on everything that the culture dictates. And we use it to oppose the Sunnah. I'm not generalizing. Not everybody, obviously not everybody, but is it the majority? Yes, it's the majority. Does it explain why we are considered backwards 
in front of many people? Yes, it does. If we had adhered to Islam with dignity, then there's nothing to be ashamed of. Wallahi. Wallahi, there's nothing shameful in our deen. There is nothing that we are scared to stand in front of the whole world and tell them straight up, yep, Islam teaches this and teaches that in spite of them not liking it, in spite of them having issues with it. We don't care. We should not care because what we have, no one has. Understand, ya Muslims, understand what I'm saying. What we have, wallahi, no one has. They, will, they dream about it. The Jews, the Jews, they lost their mind. They were, they were baffled uh, because of the ayah that Allah Azza wa Jal revealed so much so that they memorized all of the events of this, this, uh, this ayah that was revealed. When Allah revealed, This day I have completed your religion for you and completed my favor upon you and I am pleased with Islam as a religion for you. They said, they said if this ayah was revealed upon us, ma'ashar al-Yahud, we would have taken this as a, as a day of celebration. We would celebrate receiving an ayah from Allah that our religion is perfect and that Allah is pleased with us due to that. They didn't. They were not. They were unfulfilled. Because Allah knew that the final prophet would be the prophet Muhammad sallallahu We Muslims got that. We got that privilege. We are the one who received it sitting on our couches. So what do you want? This is what you have. And we're not Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're the creatures of Allah. If the people don't like it, so what? You have a problem with what I teach of Islam? No problem. You will stand before Allah on the Day of Judgment. You will resolve it then. You have, you have all, the, all the tools you need to speak before Allah on Yawm Al-Qiyamah if you will be allowed to speak. We, it's not our problem as Muslims. So that we wind up modifying our religion to please others, which is the disease of, of the West. The Western modernized version of Islam. Continue to change and modify, change and modify, remove, add, you know, alter, twist. Yeah, and you keep playing with it. How about now? What do you, what do you like it now? Do you like this is better? Would you like it bigger? Would you like it smaller? Would you like it fatter? Would you like it thinner? How would you like Islam? No problem. We will change it to make you happy. Allah says, the Jews and the Christians will never be pleased with you until you follow their religion. And here we are trying to change our religion to make them happy. They will not be happy. So tell them Islam as it is. In all sincerity, in all kindness, in all humbleness, tell them Islam as it is. If they don't like it, no problem. No problem. فَمَنْ شَاءَ قُوَّ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ Say, this is the truth from your Lord. Whosoever wills can believe. Whosoever wills can disbelieve. Allah gave us a free will. No problem. You don't like it? No problem. Don't accept it. On Yawm Al-Qiyamah, don't complain. That's it. So we need to stick to the etiquettes. Among the important etiquettes is that of entering upon the children and the, the maids or whoever lives in the house entering upon the uh, others in their rooms. The ayah is in Arabic, it's long, I'm going to skip to the English. It's Surah Tanur, ayah 58, you should know it. Allah says, Oh, you have believed, let those whom your right hands possess, which we had back then, we don't have today, and those who have not yet reached puberty among you, ask permission of you before entering at three times. Allah mentioned three times where people have to seek people in the house, Except children who have not reached puberty, they are exempt because they don't know any better. Uh, other than that, three times they have to end, they have to seek permission before they enter, uh, before the dawn prayer, before the dawn prayer, من قبل صلاة الفجر, and when you put aside your clothing for rest at noon, the qailula that some people have at noon time when they you know because at the time of fajr this is the time that you change from your uh, sleeping clothes perhaps to your uh, day clothes, whatever you're going to wear for the rest of the day if you're among those who wake up for Fajr and remain up. And then noon time is when you take off your clothes to take a nap. And then after the night prayer, after Salat Al-Isha. These are three times of privacy for you. Meaning anybody who wants to enter upon, let's say a husband and wife or a husband on his own or a wife on her own, upon the parents in the house, then you may not enter without seeking permission as per the etiquettes that we mentioned uh, previously. 
There is, no blame, there is no blame upon you nor upon them beyond these periods. For they continually circulate among you, some of you among others. Thus does Allah make clear to you the verses and Allah is all-knowing, all-wise. So these are the three times uh, and you must seek permission. And those three times, even the children, I'm sorry, must seek permission. I made a mistake. Let me correct myself. And those three times, even the children must seek permission. And other times, then the children may enter freely upon them because they are among the tawafin alaykum just like the cats. But otherwise, even children must be taught how to seek permission for obvious reasons because you don't want the child just to enter and see what he does not want to see. And if he sees, he will never be able to unsee. And if he sees, he will never be able to erase. And he might be traumatized for the rest of his life. And then you become guilty. Now, what happens if you take a sip of coffee? What happens is that you continue when you're done. What happens if you are praying and then someone uh, sought permission to enter? Do we have teachings of Islam from Islam about this? Of course we do. Did you not know? Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, said, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِذَا اسْتُؤْذِنَا عَلَى الرَّجُلِ وَهُوَ يُصَلِّ فَإِنَّهُ فَإِذْنُهُ التَّسْبِيحِ وَإِذَا اسْتُؤْذِنَا عَلَى الْمَرْأَةِ وَهِيَ تُصَلِّ فَإِذْنُهَا التَّصْفِيقِ And this hadith was, uh, uh, was uh, collected by Bayhaqi and it was authenticated by Shaykh Al-Abani rahimahullah. If a man is, uh, if, a man, if a permission is sought upon a man to enter while he's praying, then he gives permission by saying Subhanallah. He raises his voice by saying Subhanallah. And if a, a permission is sought upon a woman while she's praying, then she claps. Oh, I'm going to ruin the mic. Okay? Claps. And then once again, we have taught before that women in their salah, in spite of the fact that their voice is not a awra, from the etiquettes of Islam, is that she does not speak loudly in her salah. Uh, and she does not correct the imam. And in this case, she doesn't say subhanallah in a loud voice. Rather, the sunnah for her is to clap. So you can permit someone to enter upon you even if you are involved in an act of worship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that shows you the consideration that Islam has towards people because if if Islam did not care about the feelings of others and we will see other narrations to this effect then you can let the person hang outside let them wait for as long as it takes until you finish the salah La. if there's an ability for you to reconcile between them and bring the person in while you're praying inshallah ta'ala no problem طيب. Now that we've discussed the etiquettes of, of seeking permission and entering, we're going to assume right now that we are collected and gathered together. So what are the etiquettes of a gathering? The first and the most fundamental of all is the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abdullah ibn Amr قال, قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ما من قوم جلسوا مجلسا لم يذكروا الله فيه إلا إلا uh, I think I lost some of the words here. The Prophet ﷺ said, No group of people sit together in a gathering in which they do not remember Allah except that this gathering will be a source of regret for them on the day of resurrection. On the day of resurrection. Ooh. So, and it's very unlikely for a group of Muslims to sit down without mentioning Allah. Alhamdulillah. Yani, from the time you say Salaamu Alaikum Rahmatullah, Alaikum Salaam, Rahmatullah Barakatuh, Hayyakallah, Hayyakallah, Shaykh, Fadl, Fadl, Hayyakallah, Jlis. Or depending on your country, you're going to use your own language. Uh, you've already mentioned Allah. Kev Halak, how you doing? Alhamdulillah, I'm doing fine. And that's something we should teach our children to begin by saying, yani, to learn how to say Alhamdulillah, not fine. F fine is a tissue, okay? Alhamdulillah, I'm fine. Yani, let them learn how to remember Allah. And your Lord has proclaimed, if you show thankfulness, I will increase you. You need to train and program your mind and the children to be thankful to Allah Azza wa Jal. Always remind your kids, everything you have, including your parents and the home that you live in and whatever game consoles you may have and whatever books you have and whatever clothes you have and whatever toys you have and whatever, everything you have is from Allah. There are people out there that don't have anything. Allah Azza wa Jal favored us over so many of His creation with His wisdom, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it doesn't mean that those who are deprived are in a better condition than we are. Subhanallah. They may not, they may not have the dunya and have the akhirah. That's why it's Allah's business. It's Allah's business with His creation. It's Allah's hikmah with His creation. But our job is to be content 
with whatever blessings we have. It was narrated in Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah uh, that the Prophet Ibn Umar said that we used to count in one gathering the Prophet وسلم, saying over 100 times Rabbi ighfir li wa tub alayya innaka anta tawwabur rahim aw tawwabul ghafur two different wordings my lord forgive me and accept my repentance verily you are the one who accepts the repentance the forgiving or another narration the merciful in one gathering they would count a hundred times the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say that what does that make me and you someone who already ghafara lahu ghafara allah lahu ma taqaddama min dhanbihi wa ma ta'akhkhar allah already forgave his future and previous sins he will say this a hundred times in a gathering. Do we say it even once? You answer. Another etiquette is, and it's very important, النهي عن إقامة الرجل من مجلسه وعن ابن عمر عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه نهى أن يقام الرجل من مجلسه ويجلس, ويجلس فيه آخر ولكن تفسحوا وتوسعوا A very common practice in our culture is that a person will get up, a man will, will uh, get up, uh, will be asked to, to leave, and then another person will sit in his place. Huh? It is not from the sunnah that you make someone get up and then you sit in his place, rather you should make space and room. Now this is different than when you want to honor someone by offering them your seat. Such as when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when his daughter Fatima would enter upon him, he والسلام, will make her sit in his place. So that's different than when you want to honor someone by giving him your place, and then someone entering saying, Ya Wakhir, Ya Ahmed, Wakhir, move. And then he sits in your place. And you and you will think that who would do this? Believe it or not, there are many people who do this. And if I were to compare this to... Uh, I'll leave it for later. I'll leave it for later. Because see, a lot of the things which we cannot apply in a physical uh, context, we can apply in a social media context. I forgot. When we speak about seeking permission, peep, until now, I've said it a million times, I actually made a clip with Kalima on this so many years ago, subhanAllah. I don't know if it ever it was ever watched by anyone. The Creating groups until now, you find yourself every day, almost every day, in a group that has like hundreds of people. And all of them are just numbers. Two, three, four, blah, 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 six, seven, blah, 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 eight. And then some dude adds you to a group, and in my experience, 80% of the time, it's not even the language I speak. And yani, yeah, yani, either put me in an English group, or put me in an Arabic group. La, la, it's always some other foreign language. And somebody invites you without your permission into a group, and then you ask, what's going on here? And no one answers. Then you feel bad that you have to exit the group. And you go through the hassle of exiting the group and deleting the group. And I always wonder, ya akhi, ya akhi, if you wanted to add people, barakallah feek, out of, out, of, out of manners, you communicate with those individuals by one by one. Yes, yes. One by one, you contact fulan. Ya Abu Musab, I'm going to make a group about, you know, uh, 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 football. Or about asking Islamic questions. Would you mind? Not just me, with anybody. Would you mind? Uh, yeah, go at Habibi. Or no, Wallahi, I have plenty of groups. Please forgive me, brother. Wallahi, I don't have time. So then you either add the person, and then when he comes in, he knows what he's getting into. He's comfortable. This, you know, Because you see, you enter the group, and then the first thing you see is, Fulan left the group. Fulan left the group. Fulan left the group. Everybody's leaving. Because everybody came in in spite of them. The way I see it is like you were sitting at home, someone comes in, he blindfolds you, kidnaps you, takes you to his house, and then suddenly he unfolds, he removes the blindfold, and then he has, here, tfaddal shay. Ya baba ishfi, I was at home. And then you kidnap, you bring me to your house, and you force me to eat cake and tea with you, you could have at least called me, said, would you like to come to my house? So the fact, it, to me, this is the same exact thing. You putting me in a group without my permission, Putting any Muslim in a group without their permission is like kidnapping from their home and forcing them to come to your house without alignment. Ma'istakim ya Sheikh, Ashfi. Wallah ma'isir kida. Yani takhantuwa min al-akhir. Ktir ktir azabtuna hai. 
خلص اللعب هذا كله والفزلكة بدنا نبطلها شوي بيحكي سعودي شوي بيحكي لبناني بتطاطع شو عم بيحكي شوي بيحكي انجليزي المهم تفهموا علي نكون على نفس الموجة the same wave did I lose you there good so I want to make sure that you're alert because you probably right now your brain is working what is he saying what is he saying so you're paying attention to the lecture just in case you get diverted by something إذا رجع إلى مجلسه فأحق به another important ruling specifically to the masjid أبو هريرة نيرة that the Prophet ﷺ said إذا قام أحدكم من من قام من مجلسه ثم رجع إليه أو فهو أحق به and hadith was narrated by Muslim and Nawawi has a very uh, decent commentary on it if a person was sitting somewhere and he left his place he has more of a right to return to it uh, and Nawawi said this is specific also in the position of the masjid in the masjid whether you're sitting in the salah the place of salah or just when you're sitting in the masjid if you were sitting somewhere and you had to go to make wudu or in order to answer a phone call uh, that does not deprive you of being able to go back to your spot you have more of a right to go back to the spot which was yours um, this is now and so if you're in a masjid and you had to go you know you can go and come back to your spot you have the right and islamically you have the right to if someone took your place say Akhi, barakallah feek, i was sitting here now of course Logically speaking, you should either notify someone next to you, maybe put your uh, a piece of clothing, a pen, something that signifies that you were sitting there, just so you can avoid confusion. This, however, does not mean what many people do in Ramadan, and oh, how did we have to deal with those on a yearly basis? They would put their uh, prayer rug from Asr in the masjid. Huh? And then the guy will not appear until two minutes before Taraweeh, and the masjid is... the. Ma the masjid is jam-packed with people and the brother comes in, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, like the king, uh, move everybody, make way for me. And then he goes right behind the imam. And he was sleeping at, at home the whole time. لا يا شيخ. And he will tell you, أنا أحق بهذا المكان من غيري. No, this is, not, this is a different story. You have to earn your place in the masjid you can't just put a rug and reserve a place and, and have it for hours. It is only allowed for something temporary, such as you going out to make wudu, you going out to answer a phone call, you going out to sneeze, uh, you know, drink water, something of this nature, a very short and temporary trip. Another one of the etiquettes of uh, the gatherings, it's also Abu Huraira, and this is why you get to appreciate Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, and may Allah Azza wa Jal curse those who, who criticize him uh, among those who hate the Sahaba of the Prophet Sallam, they criticize him so badly, uh, Abu Huraira. Uh, but look, look how much information we learn about Islam from him. He said, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه إِذَا انْتَهَى أَحَدُكُمْ إِلَى مَجْلِسٍ فَلْيُسَلِّمْ فَإِنْ بَدَلَهُ أَنْ يَجْلِسْ فَلْيَجْلِسْ ثُمَّ إِذَا قَامَ فَلْيُسَلِّمْ فَلَيْسَتِ الْأُولَى بِأَحَقِّ مِنَ الْآخِرَةِ Hadith is in Tirmidhi and Abu Dawood. The Prophet said, if one of you arrives at a majlis, then let him give salam. And if he wants to sit, then let him sit. But if he gets up to leave, then let him also give salam, because verily the first one is not more, in, is not more worthy or right than the last one. Yani the first one is not superior to the last one. Just like, you gave, just like the, the salam in the beginning is something that is recommended, as we know, then so is the one at the end. So it is a sunnah for you to say Salaamu Alaikum Rahmatullah when you enter and you say Salaamu Alaikum Rahmatullah also when you leave. And a lot of people uh, replace that with Chow uh, if they're entering uh, upon people. And if you want to say Chow, fine. But also say Salaamu Alaikum Rahmatullah. Uh, among the etiquettes is that you should sit wherever the gathering, wherever the spot that is available to you is. عن جابر بن سمرة قال كنا إذا أتينا النبي نبي صلى الله عليه وسلم جلس أحدنا حيث ينتهي. When we would visit the Prophet ﷺ, we would sit wherever wherever the the gathering ended. So if there's a bunch of people and this is where the the last one sitting, you go and you sit over there. You don't go put yourself in the middle and you go sit in front of someone as many people do. And ya Allah, ya Allah, I want to cry, I want to cry, I want to cry from the Muslims. Ya Muslims, ya brothers, I love you for the sake of Allah, but what you do on Jumu'ah is haram. What we do on Jumu'ah is ya Allah, every Jumu'ah we have the same disaster. You'll be sitting in fi amanillah. 
a person comes yeah, in the middle of the khutbah, in the middle of the khutbah, and he walks over 25 people going over their shoulders just against the hadith, exactly against the hadith, and then he puts himself in a place where, where a cockroach doesn't fit. And he just sits, and now everybody has to... Ya hajj, ma yiji, ma yisir, wallah ma yisir. If you come late, the tax of being late is that you sit in the back. You cannot come and disturb the people and go over their necks, because, their necks and shoulders to grant yourself a place in the front when you did not earn or deserve this place. And this is one of the worst habits that we have. What entitles one of us to hurt and harm so many Muslims? When, when a man did this during the time of Prophet the Prophet and the khutbah, he stopped his khutbah and he told them, sit down, ijlis. You have harmed the people. You have harmed the people. It is prohibited for you to do this. It is haram for you to do this. You annoy all these people for your own satisfaction. What level of selfishness is this? You come, you sit wherever there's an empty spot in the back where you belong because you came late. When I come late, I have the same obligation. All of us have the same obligation. You may not come and disturb the people in this manner. Today, people have no consideration. Look at the other hadith from Abdullah ibn Amr also. Prophet said, Similarly, you may not sit there and, and place yourself between two people unless you seek permission from them. This is in the context that you're not in Salatul Jumu'ah. You don't just come and, and invite yourself between two people. You have to seek permission. Ma'alaysh, ya Abdullah, do you mind? Tafaddal, hayyak Allah. Or says, La wallah, akhi, I'm speaking to him. Come sit to my right or come sit to my left. No problem. But for Salatul Jumu'ah, brothers, please share this. Share this. When you come to Salatul Jumu'ah, when you come to Jama'ah in general, Jama'ah in general, but specifically on Friday when the Imam is given khutbah, Allah yirda alayk. May Allah be pleased with you. Get the reward from Allah and sit where there is a spot. Not in the front. You may not go over any Muslim by crossing over him. Some of the scholars said, if you see a legitimate open spot in the front, miraculously, everybody just left it, and you can go there without harming anyone, hayyak Allah. If not, no, no, no. So be very careful. Among the etiquettes of the majlis, which is also forgotten and abandoned, is what is known as kafaratul majlis, and how important. We actually, nowadays, Muslims, we need this in every single gathering. In every single gathering, because hardly do we, we hardly have a gathering where we don't wind up saying things that idle talk and things that could be uh, sinful, uh, backbiting mistakenly, uh, criticizing mistakenly, uh, mocking someone mistake. We might do something somehow, some way that is erroneous. And we are all subject to this mistake. Everybody's subject to these errors. So how do you rectify them if you're sitting in a gathering? You follow the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ from Abu Huraira. مَنْ جَلَسَ فِي مَجْلِسٍ فَكَثُرَ فِيهِ لَغَطُهُ فَقَالَ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَقُومَ مِنْ مَجْلِسِهِ ذَلِكَ سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُمَّ بِحَمْدِكَ أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ أَسْتَغْفِرُكَ وَأَتُوبُ إِلَيْكَ إِلَّا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا كَانَ فِي مَجْلِهِ مَجْلِسِهِ ذَلِكَ The Prophet said, if any one of you sits in a gathering and he speaks a lot, a lot of idle talk, a lot of mistakes, a lot of, uh, a lot of expressions were made, and then he says before he gets up from his, from his seat, uh, Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik, glory be to how perfect you are, Allah. And praise be to you. I bear witness that there's no deity worthy of worship except you. I seek your forgiveness and I turn to you in repentance, except that Allah will forgive whatever He said in that message. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah for this outlet. Because if we didn't have this outlet, my brothers and sisters, we will be in serious trouble. Now I ask you for Allah's sake, let us all revive this abandoned sunnah as well. We usually do this at the end of a lecture, at the end of a, uh, you know, a, 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 a Islamic gathering of some sort, a recitation of the Quran. But actually this is due on a lot of our social gatherings because that's when we actually have the most errors and mistakes. So let us practice the sunnah. Let us practice the sunnah of making this dua before we get up from where we're sitting so that we may attain the forgiveness of Allah Azza wa for any errors that we might have made during that particular gathering. Among the etiquettes of, of the gatherings is that, and this shows you the compassion of Islam, uh, which reminds me, I, I made the statement, and I think one of the talks on, on this uh, series, 
I said, uh, Islam teaches such and such. And a person left in the comment, he said, Oh, I didn't know that Islam was uh, a thing or a person. I think he said, something or a person. Ya akhi, yani, barakallah feek, it's an opportunity to, to reply to you. Uh, who said that uh, only a, a person uh, may uh, is, uh, have speech attributed to them? Who said, in which language, whether Arabic or English, who necessitated and restricted that you can say uh, that it has to be a human being for you to say uh, that thing teaches? When you say our culture teaches such and such, our, our government teaches such and such, and the government is an entity, uh, anything of the sort, Islam teaches, meaning the revelation of the, the teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah. And you may attribute the verb or the quality of teaching to the religion, because that's what the religion teaches. It doesn't have to be a man to say this man teaches. So yani, sometimes we get particular about things that we shouldn't get very particular about. No, just if we have more awareness and a broader information, then we will be more, uh, you know, considerate about some of these things where people usually get offended and they go on the attack when they could have probably been a little bit more accommodating. Ala kulli hal, an Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, an Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, qala nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, idha kuntum thalatha, fala yatanaja rajulani dun al-akhar, hat. Hadith is a Bukhari and Muslim. And the reason why? Because that la This might cause that person to be sad. I had the, the words uh, mixed up here. The meaning of the hadith, and that is the important thing. The Prophet said, if you are three, then two people should not have a private conversation among them in order not to make that third person sad. Now, this also applies according to the scholars when it comes to language usage. So if there are three people um, and two of, them, uh, uh, two of them speak Arabic uh, and one of them does not, and the other people, and then, but all of them speak English, the two people speaking Arabic should not speak to each other and ignore the third person in their private language because the shaitan would, might insinuate to him that they're saying something bad about him and it will make him sad. So out of consideration, you don't have these kind of whispering private conversations and you leave someone out in order not to mess with his brain. And you also don't use a same language when you can speak a language that is understandable by everybody out of consideration. Of course, there are exceptions to this rule. It is not black and white, but these are the etiquette of a consideration that teaches you that Islam looks after the uh, well-being, the, the mental well-being of people. And that Islam, one of the objectives of Islam is to eliminate any hard feelings or any ill feelings or any negative feelings that one may have due to the behavior of others. If you actually look at the common denominator and that which correlates everything that I've mentioned today in terms of the etiquettes, you will find that all of them are based on the concept and the principle of being considerate to, your, uh, to others and others being considerate to you. And this also falls under the concept of the Prophet ﷺ, who said in hadith, لا ضرر ولا ضرر. There should be no harm caused and there should be no reciprocation, reciprocation of harm. So you neither harm others nor do you want harm to be upon yourself. And we have a lot to learn. We, and, and even though we know we have a lot uh, that we need to implement that we are simply not implementing. But Alhamdulillah, uh, the reminder will benefit the believers and those things are being mentioned so that we may practice them. Again, brothers and sisters, Ramadan remains to be the golden opportunity to initiate all of these projects. The sooner we start training ourselves to implement these things, the better. Because right now we have the advantage of the shayateen being chained. When they go back out on the first day of Eid, then you, know, you will find it more challenging for you to adhere to these things. But now is the time to do so. So let us be considerate on all platforms. And again, I want to conclude my reminder and this lesson with the etiquettes of social media because a lot of the things I mentioned are related to physical locations. And today you may say because of COVID-19, uh, now it's COVID-20, uh, there's not much to be done. We have a lot of parallels between real life and social media life. So you have to display 
the same kind of behavior in your comments, when you criticize, when you, uh, when you, you know, deal with people in groups, when you send multiple messages, someone will ask you a question. And then, you know, I've mentioned this before, and they see that you have a message, okay? They have that blue tick or whatever. And then they send you question mark, two question mark, three question mark, four question mark, as if you're a hired, uh, yani you're a hired agent uh, whose job is to reply to his questions instantaneously. Sometimes you read the, the question. So, you know, you have to observe patience. This is a form of seeking permission. A lot of people don't even say Salamu Alaikum Wala Hayakallah Wala Kif Halak. They ala tool, ala tool. They send you the question or they call you on the phone. A brother, if I'm going for Umrah, Tabi brother, what what if I'm not available? Yeah, brother, ma, let's let's yeah, first a couple of words of kindness towards each other. That's one extreme where people have no consideration to you and your personal time and they want everything ala tool, ala tool, ala tool. They start writing caps lock and big letters and bold letters, like I want your attention now. The other extreme as people that beat around the bush forever. Yani, and especially on Facebook. I remember now I remember why Facebook was such an issue. On Facebook, a person adds you as a friend. Alhamdulillah, you know, you accept the, the, the request. They have a 20 minute conversation with you asking you every question. How is the situation of COVID-19 in Saudi? Where in Saudi are you? Where are you from? A brother, how old are you? Tab, how is the weather over there? And what about, ya akhi, ya akhi, what do you, Habibi, ma, we, nobody has time to have a 25 minute conversation with everyone chatting. I'm not, we're not at a tea uh, or a coffee shop that we're getting to know each other because you're going to propose uh, to my daughter or, uh, you know, we don't have, what is, what is the occasion? Then when you say, brother, barakallah feek, and you try to be nice and, and, and accommodating, brother, is there anything you need? No, no, brother, just wanted to, you know, get to know you. Ma, habibi, ma, yani, tab, ma, you can get to know me in, in a brief sense. So again, uh, consider other people's uh, time. So when you want to speak with someone, or if you want to send a voice message, don't send a 15 minute voice message ranting on and on, repeating. Anytime we want to communicate with the world, we need to have a preparation. You have to prepare. It's not fair that you can't arrange your ideas and you want someone to answer your question, you don't give enough information, so the question becomes a long back and forth before you get to understand what that person wants. These are just little tips and tricks so we can all be good. Because I know you want to be good, I want to be good, we all want to be good. So it's all good insha'Allah. Zakumullah khair, barakallah feekum, subhanakallah bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka atubu alayk, wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thanks for watching this video. Subscribe and click on the notification bell. Like, comment, and share with friends and family.